Our gospel lesson for the day is Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Listen for God's word that is for us in this day. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever looked back at... That story we've heard again and again and shows up in advertisements and literature and longingly thought, Adam and Eve had it made. You've thought that, right? I mean, right there at the beginning of Scripture, we have this idyllic picture of a garden filled with bountiful trees and friendly animals, well, mostly, and amazing weather. Scripture implies that it doesn't even rain as the streams are filled with waters from below. Adam and Eve lived in this garden and they were given the cushy job of maintaining it. Sound like a good life to anyone? Anyone want to apply for that job to care for the garden? It seems like it's as close as creation has to a perfect life. And Adam and Eve had it. To top it all off, as evening came and the breeze arrived, God walked with them in the midst of the evening and the breeze. Until one day when they didn't show up to walk with God. And for today, those reasons don't matter. It happened. Now, I appreciate the way that Samuel Wells summarizes things. He says, the serpent was right. When Eve and Adam ate the fruit, they did not die. Instead, they saw more clearly. But it turned out that seeing more clearly wasn't really a blessing. Something did die. The joy of unself-consciousness. When Eve and Adam saw more clearly, they saw that they were naked. And a few fig leaves and a hastily sewn loincloth couldn't hide the fact that they were no longer at home in their bodies, at home with one another, at home in the garden, and at home with God. They left that idyllic garden that was no longer idyllic, and they were no longer at home. They entered the wild unknowns, the wilderness. Now, back in my mid-20s, home was a major issue for me. 
Now, looking back, your mid-20s are a very appropriate time for one to reorient one's sense of home. But wow, it was hard. Now, I'd like to blame it on the circumstances or on New Jersey, this crazy place that I moved where, you know, you can't turn left and Wawa is an actual place and <laughs> donuts seem to be a food group. It's crazy, right? But the core issue was about me, who I was, and what was my home 3,000 miles from where I was born, right? It's really hard. So this week, I was, as I was reading, I became introduced to Candace Benbow, and she's a theologian. And the year that her mother died, she had a different encounter with Lent. This is some of what she writes. She says, last year a friend asked what I would be giving up for Lent. I told him that because I'd already lost so much, I wasn't intentionally giving up anything else. Mama had only been gone a few months, and I was embarking on my first Easter without her. I didn't have the energy to fast from anything because it was taking every ounce of strength to make it through each day. Churchy and unconvinced that Lent wouldn't be helpful, my friend told me that was why I needed to fast. He said, I needed to be in a space where God could see my pain and honor my sacrifice. I called BS on that and ate Talenti and Harbor Har gummy bears for 40 days and 40 nights. Yet, what Candace did ask from her family and friends was to be reminded of her identity. She needed to know and hear again and be reminded that she was beloved by God that God was with her, that the kingdom of God was at hand, and that nothing, not life, nor death, nor any wilderness you can walk through could take that away. When we are no longer at home, or find that our homes are no longer secure or remind us of loss because of our choices or the realities of life or the choices of another, the truth is we enter into the wilderness. And the wilderness is scary. It's a place we avoid for good reason, yet it's also a place where God meets us. Maybe strange to think of it that way, and sometimes we think of the wilderness as a place where God is absent or far away. Yeah, but the story of Scripture shows us again and again is that God is right there in the midst of the wilderness. Right after Adam and Eve leave the garden into the wilds of the world, they named their firstborn son, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. God is still there. When Hagar ran into the wilderness to escape Sarah's bullying, God met her. And there Hagar gave God a name, El Roy, which means God who sees. God sees us in our wilderness. And then there's Moses, who one day was keeping flocks with his father-in-law, and he went beyond the wilderness. And there, in a flame that did not consume, Moses met God. And there Moses asked God for a name, was told, I am who I am then later goes back into the wilderness and this time leading God's people and they were there and God was before them in a pillar of cloud by night by day and a pillar of fire by night you've heard that before right sorry I mixed it up 
what we find throughout Scripture is this amazingly beautiful truth that God has been, God will be, and God is in the wilderness, each and every kind of wilderness, even when it doesn't feel like it. Jesus, too, went into the wilderness. Forty days, Jesus went into this difficult place, and he, too, felt loneliness. He, too, felt great temptation for things that seemed like they would be so right and yet threatened to betray exactly who he was and what his goals were. Debbie Thomas describes it this way. She says, at his baptism, Jesus heard the absolute truth about who he was. That was the easy part. The much harder part came in the wilderness when he had to face down every vicious assault on that truth. When the memory of his father's voice from heaven faded and he had to learn how to be God's beloved in a lonely wasteland. Maybe we, like Jesus, need long stints in the wilderness to learn what it really means to be God's beloved. Because the unnerving fact is we can be beloved and uncomfortable at the same time. We can be beloved and unsafe at the same time. In the wilderness, the love that survives is flinty, not soft, salvific, and not sentimental. Learning to trust Learning to trust it takes time. Several weeks back, we, we did read Jesus' baptism and how those skies open up and the voice from heaven declares that Jesus is God's beloved. Jesus tells us that we are God's beloved. This can be hard to believe when life is easy, yet it's true even when life is hard. And so God comes into the wilderness, into our wildernesses, and the wilderness is a place where God reminds us of who we are without all the stuff. That's why fasting can be very helpful in this season. Because without all the stuff, just us, we are God's beloved. And so much in the world tries to take that truth away. So today, if you are in the wilderness, know that God is with you. And no matter what, you are still God's beloved. Today, if you are in the easier season of life, before or after the wilderness, open your eyes and heart that you might see those around you, some who are silently suffering in the wilderness, see them. Don't try to fix them. That never works anyway, right? Just go and be with them quietly. Pray for them. And if the moment presents itself, remind them that they are God's beloved. Together we will walk through this season of Lent looking at how Jesus meets people, people just like us in the midst of of their wilderness. The wilderness is uncomfortable. It can be scary and disorienting. Yet through it may also be the way home. Home with God. Home with ourselves. Home with one another. O oh Lord, help us 
Meet us where we are and show us again the way home. Amen.